Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on harnessing social protection to address violence against women and girls. Today's webinar is being co-hosted by Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, or DFAT, and Australia's National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, or ANROSE. My name is Padma Raman. I'm the CEO of ANROSE. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I come to you from, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I would also like to acknowledge First Nations people from across the world who are joining the webinar today. I recognize their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay deep respects to elders past, present and emerging. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Today's session is being recorded and can be accessed by the public um, through the socialprotection.org website. To prevent background noise and feedback, please put yourselves on mute if you haven't already done so. And we will have time for questions and answers following the presentations. So please send your questions through um, throughout the session using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. I want to take a moment to recognize that violence affects many people directly, and some may find the content of this discussion distressing. So if you need a moment, please feel free to step away from this discussion and please seek out a person you trust or support services such as 1800RESPECT in Australia or a helpline in your country. Findhelpline.com can help you find an appropriate support service. And if you're in danger, please contact the emergency health services for your location. We know there is compelling evidence that social protection has the potential to narrow gender equality gaps across a wide range of human development and empowerment outcomes. We also have emerging evidence of the potential of cash transfers to support prevention of violence against women and girls, specifically intimate partner violence. This is a new area of research, but there is much to learn from the emerging evidence, even if it's fairly new. Because there are real do no harm risks, this evidence needs to inform the design of new social protection approaches. This webinar will provide an in-depth look at these issues so we can implement relevant learnings in our social protection responses. I will now hand over to Sarah Goulding, Assistant Secretary of DFAT's Gender Equality Branch to open this webinar today. Over to you, Sarah. Sarah. Thank you so much for that uh, opening, Padma. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging, as is customary, that I am joining you from the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal people. I've had the privilege of learning how to say an acknowledgement in their language, an emerging language, which I'll do so now. Duwaranuna Duwaranunawal, Yangu Nalawiri Dunimanyan, Nunawalwari Duwaruwari, Ningara Dindi, Wangurali Jinyan. This is Ngunnawal country. Today we are all meeting together on this Ngunnawal country. We acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders. This is such an important conversation. Uh, my name is Sarah Golding. I'm the Assistant Secretary of Gender Equality in the Department of Foreign Affairs in Australia. Uh, and for a very, very long time, uh, our work through the Australian Aid Program has been engaging with partners in countries uh, globally, uh, but particularly in the Asia Pacific on the challenge of addressing gender-based violence. In most countries in the Asia Pacific, 30 to 55% of women have experienced gender-based violence. We know that it has severe negative consequences for women, families, communities and societies. Even the most conservative of figures estimate that the costs to society and to governments are in run to the billions of dollars in GDP, up to 2% in some countries. For example, in Bangladesh, economic costs of violence against women are in fact higher than the costs of primary education. In our 
in the country I join you from, Australia. The Department of Social Services estimated that the cost of violence against women and their children on the Australian economy is around 15.6 billion in this last uh, financial year, 2021-2022. What do we know when we look at the question of social protection and the challenge of gender-based violence? We know that cash transfers and broader social protection measures can play an essential role in helping to mitigate and reduce gender-based violence and violence against children. And it does this by addressing the risk factors of poverty and economic stress. With increased focus on gender responsive or transformative objections, social protection programs have got huge potential to address the structural barriers to gender equality, poverty reduction and gender-based violence risks and violence across the life cycle. Now, the evidence this linking cash transfers and reductions in intimate partner violence is growing. It's um, gone from emerging to something, a body of evidence that's growing rapidly. But what we do know is that the social protection programs, cash transfer programs are really purposefully designed to have an impact on these gender-based violence risks. They're often designed with a focus to addressing monetary poverty solely and economic vulnerability solely. But what we do know is that gender-based violence undermines the objectives uh, of development, human rights, wellbeing, and investments in human capital that are made through other fora. So all these different monetary and economic vulnerability objectives that safety nets work hard to achieve are undermined by gender-based violence. So there is a critical opportunity, given what we know of the emerging evidence of drawing on these protective factors, that social protection policies and programs are holistic. We shift the agenda and engagement to consider and address risk to their effectiveness. How can this happen? Well, we can design social protection programs in ways that mitigate risks and monitors for adverse effects. That's one way to reduce the risk of violence in a household. It's a do no harm approach which should be the absolute minimum of what we strive for. Secondly, what the other thing that we know is that social protection, well-designed social protection at key life cycle risk points can reduce the vulnerability experienced by women and girls to violence by challenging unequal gender norms. For example, it can be reduced to leverage um, to address household and individual financial stress at times of particular vulnerability, such as during a natural disaster, which can be an escalator of violence. It can also provide a role in providing vital and timely support to survivors of violence in their immediate needs in leaving a violent situation. They can play a protective role at key points in the life cycle in terms of during adolescence to help girls stay at school, which is a protective factor against the risks of early marriage, that form of gender-based violence, and during pregnancy and childbirth to address the critical issues of nutrition and care needs and alleviating household economic stress. Other things that we know is that social protection also has a role in increasing women's social capital and control over decisions in the household, a level of agency. This can address some of the drivers and harmful practices that lead to and contribute towards gender-based violence, including inequitable gender power dynamics. Now, in traversing this territory, social protection alone is not a, uh, a measure that can resolve violence against women and children, but it does provide a critical avenue for addressing different dimensions of the problem. So our interest as Australia in working with partner countries in the Asia Pacific and globally, including with this partnership with socialprotection.org, is to increase the quality of the conversation around how gender-based 
and gender responsive social protection systems that connect with other essential services can be leveraged to address structural inequalities and poverty, including gender-based violence. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I look at news around the economy, I am not seeing the positive economic response as the globe recovery covers from the pandemic that I so long to see. I'm seeing an increasing severity of economic shocks, particularly with the prices of fuel and other and, and food and other commodities rapidly increasingly. So what this means and what we know from the experience of the pandemic is that governments worldwide turn to social protection, turn to cash transfers as a critical opportunity to support communities at these times of crisis. So this gives us a really powerful opportunity to promote the design of integrated policies and, and strengthened investments in gender responsive social protection systems and use those as a tool to safeguard against gender-based violence. What we're going to get the opportunity to hear from in this webinar is recent research at, that provides evidence at this intersection and share emerging good practice. If you're interested in exploring this topic further following the webinar, there's a lot of really great resources on socialprotection.org website, including recordings from previous webinars. But one I'd like to particularly highlight is the World Bank Safety First e-learning course, which is going to be launched shortly. It's based on an operational guidance paper called Safety First, How to Leverage Safety Nets to Prevent Gender-Based Violence, which can be found on the World Bank's website. It's a course for social protection practitioners who'd like to learn more. I'm going to hand back now to Padma. Thank you so very much, everyone, for joining this very important conversation. I wish us well for a great set of learnings. Over. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I think that was a really great framing for our discussion today. Today, we'll hear from a number of speakers on this important topic. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers who will present on recent research in this space. Michelle Robinson is the Director of Evidence to Action at ANROSE, and Michelle will speak to us about the latest research from ANROSE on the relationship between economic insecurity and violence against women. Dr. Tara Cookson is the co-founder and director of research at Ladysmith. Tara will speak to us today about the findings of an evidence review commissioned by UN Women on addressing gender-based violence through social protection. I will now hand over to Michelle, who will begin today's discussion on the latest research on harnessing social protection to address violence against women and girls in Australia. Over to you, Michelle. Thanks so much, Padma. <clears throat> and thanks to Sarah. Um, that was a great framing indeed. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Gadigal land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Thank you to all for having us here today. Anne Rose is really honoured to be invited to share our research on an international platform. By way of context, Anne Rose is an independent research organisation producing and translating uh, uh, evidence to improve women and safe, the safety of women and children. We are one of the only research organisations in the world dedicated specifically to building the evidence base to end violence against women and children. And as part of this, we lead Australia's national research agenda to reduce violence against women and their children. We strongly believe in the importance of building an international community committed to ending violence against women. Earlier this year, Anne Summers, renowned feminist writer and uh, business school professor from the University of Sydney, released her report, University of Technology in Sydney, released her report using never before published customised data released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. The report argues that while this choice to use violence against women that breaks families apart, it is government policy that leads to many women experiencing financial insecurity when they leave, including being pushed into a state of poverty. According to the data, 30% of women who had who had experienced domestic abuse from their partner had left the relationship on at least one occasion, but later returned. While many returned because they loved their partner, wanted to make it work, 
or were promised by their partner that their behaviour would change, 15% of women returned because they had no money and nowhere else to go. When women did leave, the financial impacts were significant. They were forced to leave property or assets behind. While 60% of single mothers who had experienced domestic and family violence were employed, Anne Summers found that many were not earning enough to support themselves and their children. 50% were reliant on federal government benefits as their main source of income. Many of these women and their children were living life on the poverty line with welfare payments not in keeping with the cost of living in Australia. Summers argues that this impossible choice, violence or poverty, is forged through attention in dueling policy responses. While policy frameworks ostensibly promote leaving violence, current social and security policy, current social security policy rather, ensures that as many as half the women who choose to leave will end up in poverty. I start with this study today because since its release earlier this year, it has proven to be a formative uh, conversation in Australia especially when it comes to the role of social protections in reducing violence against women and supporting their access to not just survive, but thrive when they choose to leave a violent partner. We know that no woman or girl is immune from experiencing the intimate terrorism of domestic and family violence. This includes those who are financially well off. But the evidence does paint a compelling picture that violence can exacerbate or even compel women into financial precarity or poverty and that where financial safety nets do not exist, there are fewer options to leave violence. Today, I'm gonna to use and explain some of our own ANRO's research to delve further into the point that Anne Summers makes. If national policy to end violence is largely underpinned by a logic that propels victims and survivors to leave violent relationships, then there must be the protections, that so, the social protections in place to allow women to leave safely. This means physical and emotional safety as well as financial safety. This isn't necessarily straightforward. The drivers and the impacts of violence are diverse and they occur across entire lifetimes and not in any linear order. They are felt most accurately by women experiencing multiple forms of structural disadvantage or discrimination. Because of this, the evidence shows we need leadership, bravery and flexibility in leveraging social protection from childhood through to older age. A recent ANRO study focused on women's experiences of economic security in intimate partner violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 was a unique opportunity to study the relationship between economic security and intimate partner violence as the pandemic affected changes in financial and employment status for many households across Australia and indeed globally. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, in early May to early April 2020, more than one in five Australians reported that at least one person in their household had experienced one or more financial stresses due to the pandemic. Studies found the probability of first-time violence was 1.8 times higher among women who experienced an increase in financial stress during the pandemic compared to those who did not. This increased risk was likely spurred on by a combination of stresses like job losses and isolation through the widespread lockdowns across the country. Now, we're not saying that financial stress causes violence because not all women who reported an increase in financial stress experienced violence, but it did present a significant situational stressor impacting women's safety during the pandemic. Anne Rose's research in this area found that financial stress, economic security and income inequality are significantly linked to violence against women. Women who lost jobs or work were more likely than women whose employment was unaffected during the pandemic to have experienced physical violence and sexual violence for the first time. When financial stress levels were considered medium to high as opposed to low, there was an increased likelihood of violence or an escalation in existing violence. Even any economic hardship increased the likelihood of violence or its escalation. That economic hardship was associated both with first time and repeat violence, suggests it's not an easy, it's not easy to disentangle which aspects of economic insecurity are a cause, a characteristic, or a consequence of intimate partner violence. 
We need to think about the context of both partners and the role of economic disparity and parity and consider the impact of multiple stresses. It's not a simple equation. Economic precarity does not equate to risk, just as economic security does not equal safety. For example, from the study, we learned that women who were the main income earners were more likely to experience intimate partner violence. In other words, these factors were not on their own protective mechanisms. Schemes focusing on improving the economic status of women may not in their own right mitigate the risk of intimate partner violence in all circumstances. Instead, we need to think smartly and empathetically about what evidence tells us of the complexity of the entanglement between violence and financial stress. The way both violence and economic hardship can occur in acute moments of extreme crisis and or slowly, chronically over the course of a woman's life. And we need to recognize that health, economic health is also tied up with significant factors such as housing, physical and mental health and social well-being. This point was recently reinforced by an ANRO study led by a team from the University of Newcastle here in, in New South Wales. The study was the first in Australia to use national longitudinal data to examine the prevalence and the impacts of sexual violence across a woman's life from childhood to adulthood. The research sought to understand the effects of sexual violence on, on a woman's education and health, as well as economic, social and emotional well-being. While the study's findings on the prevalence of violence as high as over 50% for women in their 20s gained headlines across the country, a less reported finding was the consistent association of sexual violence with financial pressure over time. According to the survey, women were 30 to 45% more likely to experience high financial stress if they had experienced sexual violence. The connection between sexual violence and financial stress was compounded by the health impacts of violence. Women who had experienced sexual violence reported worse physical and mental health than women who had never experienced sexual violence. They had poor health outcomes, including chronic conditions and, ex and, and experienced increased costs for accessing health services compared to women who had not experienced sexual violence. While the longitudinal study focused on sexual violence, we know that sexual violence itself is not discreet from domestic and family violence and often happens as part of domestic and family violence or intimate partner violence. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, 52% of women who experience sexual assault are assaulted by their intimate partner. In the ANRO's commissioned longitudinal study, the likelihood that sexual assault would occur within a relationship increased as women got older. When we talked about intimate partner violence or domestic and family violence, there are often multiple tactics of abuse and control. The impacts of these can be far reaching and each has its own economic and social implications for victims and survivors. Ultimately, this research shows that the way, the way that any tactic of violence becomes an obstacle to well-being and recovery and the interconnectedness of adverse outcomes, be they financial, health or well-being. It also showed that without social and economic safety nets designed to support women beyond the moment of crisis across their lifetime, that violence can have an insidious global impact on a woman's life. Together, these two studies show the need to develop overarching, tailored and multi-system responses to keep women safe. While the pandemic created catastrophic grief, government responses to COVID-19 provided a unique opportunity to enact flexible and collaborative responses at a multi-system level. And even a more unique opportunity for researchers to study the impacts in real time. In 2021, ANRO's partnered with the University of Melbourne on the Dahlia 19 uh, International Research Study, exploring innovative practice in domestic and family service provision in the context of the pandemic. And Dahlia stands for Domestic Abuse Harnessing Learnings Internationally, and it was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council in the United Kingdom. Participants in Australia consistently highlighted the same factors as having a positive impact. These included more flexible funding and less red tape or hoop jumping, a strong recognition of the importance of social housing and security, 
flexible funding came about largely via untied new funding injections into the domestic and family violence sector. States and services could allocate the funding as they saw fit, representing a degree of autonomy and flexibility not hitherto experienced. Participants could comment on a greater level of trust between government and community services and a relaxing of regulations around compliance, which led to organisations being better able to adapt and respond to emerging issues in a timely way. At federal and state levels, social and housing security was seen as critical to the safety of the community. These protections ended up being crucial safety nets for women experiencing violence. Services reported that payments for unemployed and underemployed were critical for food and housing security for single mothers. In some states, this was supported by the extra rental support offered to women escaping domestic and family violence and no eviction clauses in new leases. Unfortunately, many of these protections have been removed, even though the pandemic continues. As Professor Summers points out, for too many women in Australia, the financial impacts of leaving violence are such that they are forced into an impossible choice, violence or poverty. For many women, there is barely even a choice. It is violence and poverty or even greater poverty. When it comes to the role of social protections, there's a critical opportunity to reform our current approaches with the positive lessons learned by the pandemic and the immense change it spurred. But it isn't a single focus solution. The Dahlia project showed that economic support through, un through untied funding models allows for nimble and flexible responses, allowing help to be directed where it's most needed. The importance of this flexibility continues to be mirrored in findings from our research on children and young people's experiences of domestic and family violence. However, the COVID study, as well as the longitudinal study, showed that the relationship between economic security and safety isn't straightforward. Taken together, the research canvas today speaks to the need to consider both the intended and unintended consequences of social policies. Failure to truly understand the latter can undo the most genuine of efforts to effect reform. The longitudinal study presented a compelling picture of how gender-based violence is connected to poorer health outcomes, financial stress and re-victimisation. Interestingly, this study also highlighted the potential benefits of social protections in buffering the impacts of violence, something Sarah was talking about earlier, and the, and the impacts of violence in giving women the space to recover and heal. The study found women who were connected to accessible healthcare services and strong social support experienced far better quality of life after sexual violence. The lesson here is that health, housing and workforce involvement and livable, safe social welfare schemes all impact and are impacted by experiences of violence. Ensuring that, for example, healthcare, including mental health care, is accessible and affordable is key. To final, in final, my final comments, ultimately, the evidence points to the need for a, for a women's safety lens across all areas of social policy, with an eye toward what kind of support and interventions are necessary, not just at the time of crisis, but across a girl and woman's lifetime. While there are no easy solutions, our research points out that the critical role of victims and survivors' voices is key. Anne Rose's research has consistently reflected on the need for governments and organisations to work with victims and survivors in a meaningful way and an enduring way. This means ongoing investment in victim and survivor voices in the design, the development, implementation and evaluation of policy and its interventions, which of and in itself is a protective mechanism. Thank you. Tara, over to you. Thank you. I'm Tara Patricia Cookson, and um, I'm thrilled to be here uh, with you all today, uh, providing a brief overview of this uh, research commissioned by UN Women and conducted in collaboration with my colleagues at Lady Smith, uh, Dr. Lorena Fuentes and Ms. Jennifer Bitterly. With this research, um, we asked, 
what do we know about the use of social protection systems with all of their various components, policies, programs, administrative mechanisms, and their effectiveness or use uh, in addressing gender-based violence. So what did we do to answer this question? Well, we conducted a comprehensive scoping review of the academic and the policy or gray literature to assess the sort of state of the evidence on the interlinkages between social protection and gender-based violence. In the style of a, a classic scoping review, uh, we sought to identify key concepts, patterns, and gaps that characterize an area of work that is both emerging and relatively dispersed. And I think that uh, fairly well categorizes the sort of uh, research base on gender-based violence and social protection um, uh, fairly broadly with with a few notable exceptions that we'll get into. So important to note here is that um, what when we're identifying patterns, we're not actually uh, evaluating the programs or the effectiveness of the programs. Uh, we're, we're trying to understand what do we know, uh, what do we not know. So we captured in our study 48 academic articles and policy publications published in English between January of 2012 and May of 2022. And uh, this 48 got whittled down from about 200 articles that were originally captured and, and didn't meet our inclusion criteria. Next slide, please. So very broadly, what did we find? Well, we found that the literature tells us that social protection can prevent and respond to gender-based violence primarily by addressing economic insecurity through softening economic hardship, uh, easing financial tensions, and increasing women's autonomy, uh, themes that were very prevalent in the research that Michelle just shared. But most research is actually narrowly focused on a select few social protection instruments, and in particular, cash transfers. And this focus actually misses out a much broader opportunity uh, for impact in connecting, um, exploring social protection and the, the very specific mechanisms through which social protection can uh, prevent or help respond to gender-based violence. So we suggest that a broader social protection systems approach is needed, one that accounts for the range of policies, programs, and services that make up social protection, as well as their various administrative uh, features. Um, so the mechanisms that coordinate systems um, and that help individuals navigate what is on offer in a particular country context. Important to note here too, that when we take a systems approach, we're actually able to understand not just, for example, the impact of a conditional cash transfer program, but also what are the all of the other things that might be on offer and that might uh, support a woman who is at risk of violence or who has experienced violence. Next slide, please. So now we'll dive a little bit deeper into uh, the evidence base. So here we can see fairly clearly um, what the evidence base sort of looks like across various social protection instruments. So we found that the largest share of the pie on the, the evidence base of social protection uh, actually relates to cash transfers, both conditional and unconditional. Uh, next, you have in-kind transfers like food um, or uh, programs that offer things like diapers or um, uh, fuel subsidies, for example, public works programs that are tied into sort of the labor policy as well in a given context. We found far fewer that account for like legal or policy or data frameworks um, that sort of structure social protection systems far fewer for parental leave, employment insurance, pensions, et cetera. Notably, we found seven studies um, that address the whole system that sort of asked, okay, if we put a gender-based violence lens on, um, on a particular 
country, um, what do we see in that social protection system that may or may not offer um, a woman the kind of support uh, that Michelle described in the previous um, presentation um, that is actually needed in those situations? Next slide, please. So when we think about um, the fact that so much of the attention has been focused on cash transfers in particular, um, and we, we contrast that with all of the other components that make up social protection and that make up a social protection system, um, we can see that there is so much more scope uh, to actually investigate um, the extent to which other levers might be useful. So here we have just a bit of a diagram showing that actually social protection systems are composed of both uh, non-contributory and contributory mechanisms. So those that come from social assistance and social care and those that come through social insurance where we might have employers also involved or the private sector also involved. All of the various different kind of mechanisms that fall across those and then also the sort of systems interlinkages portion of social protection systems as well that make connections, policy connections with housing, the labor market, public services, or infrastructure. For example, what sorts of transportation mechanisms um, are uh, needed in order for a woman to get to a service, to even access her cash transfer or her housing subsidy, et cetera. Um, so we see here that there is actually a, a, a far greater scope um, for more investigation. Next slide, please. But grounding ourselves in what we did learn and what the evidence does tell us, um, we find a few entry points through which social protection has been shown to address gender-based violence. We've got three here that, um, that were the most prominent in the literature. Accompaniment models, two, training social protection implementers to recognize gender-based violence, and three, coordinating national strategies um, for that lay out a vision for social protection with action plans to address violence against women or gender-based violence. So in the case of accompaniment models, models, what we're talking about here um, are social protection programs that uh, connect um, workers, uh, we might call them our street level bureaucrats or um, our frontline workers um, that connect, um, that implement social, pro uh, social protection and um, also accompany the users of that social protection um, through kind of service pathways or programmatic um, interventions. So these um, work through introducing complementary gender-based violence elements. So you might have a cash transfer um, or an early childhood education and care um, program that has a sort of a social worker or community worker that might also introduce um, some um, awareness raising about gender-based violence or who might uh, be able to connect families to services. Um, and one of the ways that these really work is they leverage existing relationships and trust um, with social protection beneficiaries um, to address the much more kind of sensitive subject matter of gender-based violence. So second, we um, learn that there's an entry point through uh, training social protection implementers to recognize gender-based violence. Um, so in these uh, instances, um, the implementers of a program already have close contact with a large number of women. So you have the opportunity to sort of um, get a little bit closer to sort of um, objectives around scale. Um, this helps um, the sort of close contact 
um, helps potential um, or helps, sorry, program implementers identify potential cases of gender-based violence. They're in the community. Um, we do see this a lot with cash transfers, a lot with public works programs. Um, but you could also imagine how it could be um, implemented in cases um, where the programming is around, say, early childhood education and care. And these relationships can also be used to facilitate referral pathways to other essential services. And finally, we see that uh, coordinating national social protection strategies with action plans is a way to sort of create synergy and mandate at the very highest levels of government. They sort of, these plans are used to communicate a vision for what um, government will do with regards to social protection or gender-based violence. Um, and synergy at this very kind of initial level creates opportunities and increased for increased uh, uh, efficiencies in implementation. And um, both South Africa and Canada have really great examples of um, such national strategies and action plans. Um, and on the point about accompaniment models, you and women uh, colleagues will uh, present a case study of that further on. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we also um, glean from the literature some patterns around or findings around um, which design and implementation factors specifically uh, might function to reduce gender-based violence. So we see that there um, is a strong sort of um, uh, finding in the literature that baseline social norms in a context really matter. So they can either create a very enabling environment um, or they can um, lead to sort of backlash when um, women's economic empowerment is, is what's at stake here. Um, so it's really important to frame the intervention with the local context in mind. A lot of the research on this actually comes out um, out of um, public works programs, where actually what's happening is on, on in one case, you might find a public's work, public works program that gets women into the labor force, um, you know, perhaps provides in addition to um, some economic resources, also subsidies of some sort. Um, but in one context, that will actually uh, lead to an increase in gender-based violence and in another context, um, decrease gender-based violence. So it's important to pay attention to that context. Second is benefit quality in both, uh, both in terms of duration and ensuring adequacy. Third is eligibility and access. So the need to sort of decrease processing times. If a woman is needing to leave a situation and needs those economic resources, it's not reasonable to have her wait, um, you know, four months or six months for it's processed. Um, Delinking access to social protection from marital status was also important. And then we get into things that we think about less often when we're thinking of social protection, which is information management and system linkages. So we found that it was um, important to protect identifiable social protection information that might identify um, where a woman is and be publicly accessible um, to the perpetrator of the violence. And with system linkages, this is sort of getting back to what I was talking about in the previous slide, where you're actually making linkages with um, labor policies to ensure that there's actually sustainable mechanisms for women's economic empowerment or social care so that um, women have access to child care um, if um, they're having to function as a single parent. Next slide, please. So out of this, a few recommendations come to the fore, as well as a few research gaps. So in terms of recommendations, it's clear that social protection strategies should be coordinated with action plans to end violence against women. The sort of synergies that creates at a high level um, uh, created mandates, actually, that, that were um, useful in the evidence base. 
Second, ensure the adequacy of social protection benefits to enable women's economic independence and index those benefit levels to inflation, a topic um, that's particularly important or an, an element that's particularly important at the moment. Um, three, reduce risk of backlash by designing social protection interventions in light of the social norms in the local context. Four, ensure that the data is never made public in a way that compromises privacy or security. Five, encourage the uptake of the respect framework among social protection actors for use in accompaniment models and training. This is a UN Women WHO framework that's, that's really accessible. And then six, conduct mixed methods, comparative and longitudinal studies that bring theories of GBV prevention and response to bear on social protection. Last slide, please. And in terms of research gaps, because there are gaps, um, we need more research on social assistance and social insurance mechanisms that go beyond social transfers, that really dig into the other social protection mechanisms that do exist in country contexts around the world. We also need comprehensive analyses of the systems as a whole from a GBV prevention and response um, perspective. And I'd be happy to share examples of existing studies over email um, that do this. Three, we need sustainability of impact um, of social protection on GBV over the long term. What Michelle was talking about, increased evidence around this. What happens when a cash transfer program is, is finished, for example. Further research on the relationship between social norms, social protection, and gender-based violence, because we know that it's not simply a question of economics. Five, research around the coordination of social protection with social care and labor market policies, what works in this instance. And finally, research that sort of guides the effective and fair working relationships between social protection actors and the women's organizations that are actually dedicated to addressing gender-based violence sort of day in and day out. Next slide, please. So please feel free to reach out if any of this was um, uh, interesting or particularly relevant to you. I'm, I'm happy to share some of the studies that we found. And also keep an eye out for our forthcoming publication that details the study methodology and our findings in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle and Tara, for sharing the findings of your research. Um, it was really great to get that international um, mapping of, of what we know. Um, Tara, and I should have acknowledged UN Women as an important partner in bringing you this webinar today. The insights um, you've obtained from this research are really useful for informing the effective use of social protection programs to prevent, ad address and respond, gender, respond to gender-based violence. Um, and your recommendations, Tara, for what we should be thinking about um, were really insightful. Next, we'll hear from speakers highlighting how they've addressed gender-based violence in and through social protection programs. We will hear from Claudia Perugino from the Argentina Ministry for Women, Gender and Diversity. Claudia will speak to us about the Acampana program, which seeks to strengthen the economic independence of women and LGBTI plus people experiencing violence. Grace Umarcillo, Gender Specialist for Sugira Mur Mur sorry, Muriango, um, Strong Families Thriving Children Program in Rwanda will also address us. Grace won't be able to join us in person, but has kindly recorded her message for us. I now hand over to Claudia. Over to you, Claudia. Hola, buenas tardes, noches a todas, a todos, a todes. Bueno, en primer lugar, eh, contarles bueno, la satisfacción, la alegría que para nosotras 
eh, es participar en este, en este encuentro con tan gratas eh, compañeras eh, y bueno, con información tan valiosa también para nosotras. Eh, contarles que en Argentina las mujeres hemos sido protagonistas indiscutidas de luchas y logros a lo largo de nuestra historia, desde la resistencia a la conquista española llevada adelante por las mujeres de los pueblos originarios, a la lucha por la independencia, mujeres heroicas han dado muestras de valentía y coraje como Juana Zurduy y tantas otras. Esto llegando a nuestras épocas más recientes en el reclamo por la aparición con vida de las y los 30.000 desaparecidos de la última dictadura militar y el pedido de restitución de sus nietos protagonizado por madres y abuelas de Plaza de Mayo. Exponentes de estas grandes mujeres son, sin lugar a dudas, Eva Perón, y las dos veces presidenta electa y actual vicepresidenta de la Nación, Cristina Kirchner. Hacemos esta introducción ya que en estos días tuvo lugar en nuestra provincia de San Luis el 35 Encuentro Plurinacional de Mujeres y Diversidades con la participación de 130.000 concurrentes aproximadamente. Estos encuentros que se realizan en nuestro país cada año, donde nos movilizamos para debatir las distintas problemáticas que nos atraviesan, sin lugar a dudas, son el, eh, la consecuencia del programa Acompañar, ya que este programa surge como una respuesta de política pública a una demanda histórica de los feminismos en nuestro país y del movimiento de mujeres tan activo, ya que en estos encuentros era recurrente el reclamo de una política pública de apoyo integral a mujeres y diversidades en situación de violencias por motivos de género. Traigo también eh, de los encuentros de mujeres que un, uno de los últimos logros legislativos importantes en materia de género en nuestro país, que es la ley de interrupción voluntaria del embarazo, eh, ley que eh, tuvimos la alegría de tener las argentinas eh, a poco de asumir este gobierno. Del acompañar, entre las primeras características a destacar, a ver si podemos avanzar con la segunda placa. Ahí, gracias. Es que está dirigida a mujeres, es una política pública dirigida a mujeres y diversidades en situación de violencia de género en todo el país. Su objetivo principal es fortalecer la independencia económica de mujeres y diversidades en situación de violencia por motivos de género. Eh, esto es de destacar, ¿no es cierto?, que es un, una política que también contiene a las diversidades, entendiendo la afectación de los derechos eh, que, la que la violencia por motivos de género genera en esta población. Sabemos que este tipo de situaciones tiene un fuerte impacto negativo en la vida de las personas y trae como consecuencia, entre otras cuestiones, la feminización de la pobreza. Avanzamos ahí. El programa Acompañar eh, consiste en un apoyo económico para mujeres y personas de la diversidad que se encuentran en situación de violencias por motivos de género, certificada por un informe socioambiental de un dispositivo de atención local o provincial. Otro de los aspectos a destacar por la violencia, por el, el, la implementación del acompañar, es que para acceder al programa no es necesario una denuncia ni policial ni judicial, entendiendo el proceso de revictimización que muchas veces... Eh, trae el proceso de denuncia y que quizá la persona no está en condiciones de realizarla. Entonces, con la sola manifestación de la persona en situación de violencia, de lo que está atravesando, con eso y el informe que realiza eh, la profesional que la asiste puede acceder al programa. Como decimos, tiene por finalidad... Eh, cubrir los gastos esenciales de organización y desarrollo de un proyecto de vida autónomo y libre de violencias. 
El programa constituye una herramienta que junto a otros dispositivos de asistencia, asesoramiento, protección, fortalecimiento y acceso a la justicia, tenderán al acceso a derechos económicos, sociales, políticos de las personas en situación de violencia por motivos de género. El programa pretende generar un apoyo integral para crear las condiciones mínimas de autonomía de las mujeres y diversidades a través de un recurso económico a percibir por seis meses, pero también un abordaje social, cultural, que recupere y fortalezca las relaciones sociales y comunitarias es que, en que se insertan sus proyectos de vida. Avanzamos. Eh, tenemos un, hemos logrado una presencia federal a lo largo y a lo ancho del país en estos dos años de implementación, contarles que el programa se puso en marcha en septiembre del 2020, en plena pandemia, entendiendo lo que algunas de ustedes recién mencionaban, el impacto negativo que tuvo la pandemia en las personas en situación de violencia, que las llevó a estar sometidas a estas... Eh, a estas cuestiones 24 por 24 horas, los, los siete días de la semana, a pesar de, de, de la grave situación que la pandemia trajo en cuanto a la necesidad de dar respuestas en materia sanitaria, el Estado argentino atendiendo la gran demanda que se presentaba por la situación de violencia por motivos de género, implementó este programa y de esto podemos dar cuenta que eh, el programa está en las 23 provincias, en la Ciudad Autónoma de Buenos Aires, y a partir de su implementación se constituyeron 754 unidades de acompañamiento en los distintos puntos, en los distintos municipios del país. Quienes hacen el ingreso al programa a partir de entrevistas y la elaboración de un informe social de riesgo por medio del sistema integrado de casos de violencia por motivos de género. También vale destacar que eh, con la creación del Ministerio y la implementación del programa, recordemos que el Ministerio de Mujeres, Géneros y Diversidad de la Nación se creó en diciembre del 2019, a partir de la creación del Ministerio se puso en marcha este sistema integrado de casos que nos da por fin cifras de la situación de la violencia para a partir de estas cifras poder implementar las políticas públicas necesarias. Pero insisto con esto, estas 754 unidades de acompañamiento no existían en nuestro país antes de la implementación de la compañía. O sea que no solo es el, el abordaje integral a la situación de violencia, sino fortalecer y reforzar áreas de géneros locales para que puedan acompañar estas situaciones. Avanzamos. Bien, aquí tenemos un, un mapa de todo el país donde nos muestran la cantidad de situaciones eh, de las personas que están integradas al programa en un total de 196.091 personas y nos muestra un, un anclaje territorial muy importante de la acompañar en estos, insisto, dos años de implementación. Avancemos, por favor. Bien, como decíamos recién, 196.091 mujeres y diversidades en situación de violencia de género recibieron el apoyo económico y el acompañamiento integral que como mencionábamos está destinado a crear en el corto y mediano plazo condiciones básicas para la construcción de proyectos de vida sin violencia. Algunas de las, las características e interseccionalidades de las personas destinatarias del programa, también una cifra que, cifras que aportan el sistema integrado de violencias, nos dice que el 42% tiene entre 18 y 29 años el 43% entre 30 y 44, mientras que el 14% tiene entre 45 y 64 años. 
El 95% de las personas destinatarias son mujeres heterosexuales, mientras que el 5% son lesbianas, gays, bisexuales, travestis, trans, intersex, no binarias, entre otras identidades y expresiones de género. En un 84% de los casos, la persona agresora es expareja, en un 8% es pareja actual, y el resto es otro familiar, familiar de pareja o expareja u otros, allegados, superiores jerárquicos, entre otros. El 82% de las personas que accedieron al programa tienen al menos un hijo o hija, el 36% tiene a cargo el cuidado de niños, niñas, niñes, entre 6 y 14 años, mientras que el 32% de los casos, las niñas, los niños, las niñas, son menores de 6 años. Bien. 5.731 personas se encontraban embarazadas o estuvieron embarazadas recientemente a la incorporación al programa. El 9% de las personas destinatarias cuida a adultas, adultos mayores y el 2% con discapacidad. 8.592, el 4% son nacidos en otros países, de los cuales 1.680 se encuentran en condición de refugiados. 3.092 son personas con discapacidad, una de las interseccionalidades que también tomamos registro a partir de la incorporación al programa. 2.687 pertenecen a pueblos originarios. 916 son afrodescendientes, 2071 estuvieron en situación de trata de personas, 1497 están en conflicto con la ley penal. Tipos y modalidades de violencia de género referidas por las personas destinatarias. Cuando se realiza el informe que, al que recién hacíamos mención para la incorporación al programa y para medir el riesgo en el que la persona está, también se registran los tipos y modalidades de violencia que nuestra legislación determina. Predomina en un 98% de los casos la violencia doméstica, como decíamos recién. Estamos convencidas que con el acompañar vamos a disminuir situaciones de femicidios, transfemicidios, travesticidios también. La violencia institucional y laboral constituyen un 2% y un 1% respectivamente. Para el total de los casos, 84% atravesó violencia física, psicológica, 58% económica y patrimonial, 36% simbólica, 34% ambiental y 31% sexual. Bueno, muchas gracias por la posibilidad de contarles acerca del programa Acompañar, programa que su implementación nos llena de orgullo y satisfacción, y bueno, estamos comprometidos fuertemente en nuestro Estado Nacional para generar políticas públicas que apoyen a la población que peor la pasa, que son mujeres y diversidades afectados por las violencias por motivos de género. Buenas noches. Thank you, Claudia. Um, such an interesting program and great to see that uh, gender-based violence is recognized as not just affecting women, but diverse um, uh, communities as well. Um, thank you again for sharing your insights. And now we'll hear from Grace Umalisa. Um, I'll get you to put the video on. Thank you. I would like to thank UN Women and the Australian Government Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for inviting us here today to talk about Sugeta Moyango, a home visiting intervention to promote early childhood development and prevent violence and our partnership in Rwanda. My name is Teresa Betancourt. I'm Salem Professor in Global Practice and Director of the Research Program on Children in Adversity. So it was estimated now in the 2010 data that nearly 250 million children around the world are not fulfilling their developmental potential. And we see high concentrations of these risks, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. We know that these gaps in early opportunities for children <coughs> translate into costly 
consequences for individuals, but also families and broader society. Young children who are exposed to violence and uh, malnourished lack stimulation early in life and as a consequence are falling behind in their physical, cognitive, and social emotional development are more likely to perform poorly in school, especially for girls, experience poor physical and mental health throughout life, engage in high risk behaviors, especially in adolescence, have and have lower learnings later in life and be at higher risk of delinquency and overall poor adult life outcomes. So you see Rwanda there in East Africa, population 13 million people. It's the most densely populated mainland country in Africa, and it's making great strides forward. 61% of seats in parliament are held by women, and Rwanda has a strong focus on homegrown policies and initiatives that have contributed to significant improvement in access to services and human development indicators, including a, a dramatic decline in poverty from 77% in 2001 to 55% in 2017, and great improvements in life expectancy at birth uh, from just 29 years of age in the mid-1990s to 69 in 2019. But uh, intergenerational violence and other problems uh, related to violence may be linked to the trauma and loss experienced in the country during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. And so when we look at uh, gender-based violence and challenges to promoting the development and well-being of women and girls, we see it from research in the DHS as well as the Violence Against Children and Youth Survey, 28% of females age 18 to 24 had experienced physical violence prior to age 18. 27% of females 13 to 17 had experienced physical violence in the past 12 months, with 87% of those reporting experiencing more than one incident. 24% of females 18 to 24 and 12% of females 13 to 17 had experienced sexual violence in the past 12 months. These issues also extend to early childhood in working with the Mbutu Foundation and UNICEF when we conducted the early childhood development and family services baseline evaluation across 20 sites in Rwanda in 2014. We found that of children under one year of age, nearly 20% were exposed to any form of violent discipline. Children uh, two years of age to three years of age uh, exposed to violent discipline then showed much more dramatic rates at nearly uh, 80, 81 percent. And more than one third of caregivers believe that physical punishment was necessary to raise a child well. So the interventions to get Yango evolved over many years. Our earliest work from 2011 to 2012 was funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health, where we were working first with families affected by HIV and AIDS. And then over the years, working closely with the World Bank, we were able to begin to create a version of the home visiting intervention that really focused on the early years and also linking it to the social protection system uh, where we could identify families living in the most extreme levels of poverty. Uh, in our early pilots, we were looking at safety, feasibility, acceptability when done by non-specialist home visitors. And we then streamlined our modules uh, to bring them down to just 12. So this could be an affordable and uh, not time-consuming intervention for families who are also having to be involved with the Cash for Work program. We also then were able to conduct a cluster randomized trial, both pre to post intervention, and then conduct a one-year follow-up study. We're now in the process of a three-year follow-up study. And Grace will also talk about our expansion efforts using a technique that we call the Play Collaborative. Just to mention a bit about the conceptual model behind Sugiro Mayango, it's based on active in-home coaching. We have standard content in the intervention on the importance of early stimulation, nutrition, and hygiene taken from the WHO and UNICEF Care for Child Development package. But we also have content related to problem solving, conflict resolution and stress management for caregivers to reduce risks of family violence. It's meant to be a, a really important opportunity for people to learn to navigate both formal and non-formal resources and supports because we're linked to government systems. It's meant to be flexible for all family types. We can work with a range of household types and we work very hard to engage males in those home visiting sessions. Uh, we show father and male engagement in our visuals and messaging. And we also place a lot of emphasis on flexible scheduling as to when we show up. With these techniques, we've been able to engage 70% of males in our studies completed all modules, which is really exciting. At every session, there's a 15 minute play activity that's coached. 
uh, by the home visitor uh, that involves interaction of the caregivers with their young child using homemade toys that are resourced locally and iterated as the child develops, um, depending on the age of the child. And this intervention is meant to be complementary to other initiatives like ECD centers, community sensitization programs, home-based child care initiatives, and it's integrated into the social protection system. That's how we identify families most at need. So we're linked to the Vision um, Umarenge program, the VUP, which is Rwanda's flagship poverty reduction program, and the Catch for Work program, which has the goal of reducing extreme poverty, promoting gender equality, increasing attention to social safety nets. And this is really a win-win for our team because it helps us to identify and recruit the families who could most benefit. And we know that those problems of violence and underdevelopment concentrate in families in extreme poverty in Rwanda. Here are the results of our cluster randomized trial. This is published in BMC in 2020. There's a QR code that you can scan if you're interested to see the full study. But we saw that pre to post intervention with 12 home visiting modules done by a non-specialist received excellent training and excellent routine supervision and quality improvement efforts that we saw an increase in stimulation in the home in playful activities between caregivers and their children. We also saw an improvement in dietary diversity, including extra food groups added into the child's diet and increased care seeking for health problems like diarrhea and fever. Also very important, we saw a decrease in children's exposure to violent child discipline and reduced victimization of mothers in intimate partner violence. We also saw that both mothers and fathers showed a decrease in both depression and anxiety symptoms pre to post intervention. So now I'm going to turn it over to Grace to talk about the play collaborative and scaling out this evidence-based intervention while maintaining quality. My name is Marissa Grace. I'm the gender and technical specialist for Subiramuriangul. Uh, through the Play Collaborative, Subira Muryango aims to reach 10,000 uh, families while testing methods for stakeholder engagement and uh, quality improvement. The current expansion program has increased its uh, scope to include uh, of the Hewan category families with the children between zero to six months in our three districts of operation. The program is not only expanding its reach, but also testing a scaling strategy called the Pre-Collaborative, uh, a system of stakeholder engagement which aims to promote local ownership, increase program oversight, promote cross-site learning, and evidence-based decision-making with the goal to maintain quality and uh, be dealt to implementation at scale. The objective of uh, the pre collaborative meetings to create a community pra of practice among ECD stakeholders to reinforce uh, knowledge sharing, problem solving, and strengthen intervention oversight between the government agencies and programs, interventionists, civil society groups, community government workforces, as well as sector officials and village leaders. And in Rwanda, we have administrative entities from village to the national level. And uh, at village level, we have Institute Muryango, or Friends of Family Workforce, delivering the, 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 the Sujia Muryango intervention. At Seri level, we have uh, Seri mentors and the Institute Muryango Workforce, and they meet with the uh, village and the Seri government officials. Uh, they meet uh, weekly. And the, at sector level, we have sector associate trainers. Uh, uh, they meet with cell mentors and the sector government officials. And they meet also, they meet um, twice a month. At district level, we have Sujira Mudiango staff, or local officials, and the other stakeholders. They meet also twice uh, a month. At national level, we have the government advisory board, including. Sujamudiango uh, staff and uh, government representatives from Mijeprof, NCDA, uh, RBC, University of Rwanda, um, the Minister of Health, Minarok, and the Roda. And uh, at uh, national level, uh, they meet at quarterly basis. So, linking the, the child protection workforce with the stakeholders in the community through routine pre collaborative meetings are also going to sustainably and effectively address uh, problem solve and uh, uh, prevent risk factors for violence and the agriculture development for Rwanda's most vulnerable families. 
uh, home visiting around child protection workforce to understand specific needs of household and advocate for them through the pre collaborative meetings. Uh, also, the child protection workforce makes uh, relevant referrals related to social protection, uh, including health insurance, ECD centers, village garden infrastructure, the civil re 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 registration, and uh, et cetera, and uh, follow up via pre collaborative meetings. The child protection workforce also are trained and ready to respond to risk of harm cases in household including the risk of suicide, the risk of intimate partner violence, risk of um, untreated illness, and the other cases of risk of harm, and the advocate for them through the pre collaborative meeting. The Amujango is holistic and much-listed to approach to family strengthening and community problem solving increases social protection pathways for Rwanda's most vulnerable household. So the Amujango's uh, strong evidence-based proves that strengthening social and child protection system lead to positive outcomes, including reduced victimization to intimate partner violence among mothers and reduced harsh punishment of uh, younger children. The pre-collaborative implementation strategy allows practitioners to run from a community of practice, layer violence protection and ECD promotion into social protection and help families connect to need uh, support to flourish. Thank you so much to all the presenters and thank you, Teresa, for introducing that um, video from Grace. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time left uh, and there is a question on the Q&A that's being answered. Um, but I thought I would ask one of the things that's come up is the link between social protection actors and violence against women actors. How do we get the two lots of actors to work together? And what are the capacity needs for both sets of actors? I might start with Tara. Did that come through in the research? How do we actually connect um, the, 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 the sectors? So um, thank you, Padma. Um, so I would say what did come through in the research was that these strategic planning documents can be really useful um, because the planning processes for them, the actual like people sitting down and, and thinking together and identifying priorities. Um, if you can get the, the folks working on the national action plans to end violence against women with the, or gender-based violence with the folks working on the vision for social protection, that just is a key entry point for getting conversations started um, and thinking about allocation of resources and, and overlap and, and all of that thing, all of that stuff. And I would say, well, I don't know how to get them in the room together. <laughs> um, this was actually um, quite a robust topic of conversation at a recent conference that was um, specifically for uh, folks working on ending violence against women and gender-based violence saying we'd love to get in the room with the social protection folks and think about how to integrate our national action plans with what they're doing. Um, so I'll leave it there, but I, I think that's a, a nice entry point at the at the policy level. Great, thank you. Michelle, would you like yes, to add to that? I will, thanks Padma. And just building on what Tara said, I think one of the really prime examples out of the Dahlia study that we did was the finding that collaboration across the sector was greatly increased with government and policymakers. Um, domestic and family violence organisations reported greater communication and genuine collaboration and you know, real-time information and decision-making and much greater access to advising government and informing government decisions. And ANROSE has produced a synthesis on working across sectors and the general lessons apply here as well including developing a common understanding of domestic and violence uh, risk, training in a common framework, strong leadership and an authorising environment, practices, partnerships and decision-making processes that are all shared by partners 
and a belief in change and a culture of trust and learning. And I'm happy to put that into the chat. And by way of example on that latter point, we, um, uh, we worked on a project where we did exactly this. Um, Anne Rose was very closely engaged with uh, research which looked at the, um, uh, the social security um, rule around welfare payments or payments for separating couples. Um, and it was found very clearly on the basis of some of, of some of the decisions that were being made, there was a real lack of understanding of the dynamics of domestic and family violence, so much so that evidence of the violence was being used to um, substantiate a relationship in which case a woman was denied um, a, you know, single parenting or, or, or single person payment. Um, so we did undertake some training with, um, with the decision-making bodies um, who, who are in the Australian system. Um, and this has really come to fruition both here and also in, in the family court where there has been a series of, of, um, of learnings and trainings and uh, environmental but changes within the, the decision-making environment that have brought those actors together based on the evidence and a much clearer understanding of domestic and family violence, which informs the decisions and informs the protections around um, of women and their children in these in these forums. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm wondering, and we've heard of two great programs today. I'm wondering about sustainability. How do we ensure that these programs or initiatives can be sustained? and funding for these um, initiatives uh, is institutionalized. So I'd be really interested to hear from Claudia and Teresa about how we ensure long-term sustainability. Claudia? Sí, um, en ese sentido estamos pensando en crear eh, por ley el programa Acompañar, ¿sí? en, en generar una legislación nacional que garantice la prosecución de, del programa más allá del gobierno de turno que esté, porque bueno, eh, es eh, muy, muy necesario, eh, muy, ha sido, como decíamos recién, en estos dos años de puesta en marcha, hemos logrado una fortaleza eh, territorial y una solidez y una llegada a todos los puntos de, del país, de modo que bueno, pensamos que con una ley eh, puede estar garantizado, no obstante, bueno, también con el gobierno de turno, ¿no es cierto? Nosotros sabemos que gobiernos de tinte popular, que tienen una mirada puesta en los sectores más vulnerados históricamente, eh, estos, estos, estas políticas públicas se sostienen, ¿no? Y con gobiernos de tinte neoliberal, estas políticas públicas desaparecen. Así que, bueno, una cosa de la mano de la otra es lo que, lo que tienen que garantizar el sostenimiento de, insisto, ¿no? Políticas públicas, y como vos también, Padma, lo, lo destacabas y lo rescatabas del acompañar, que no solo es para mujeres, sino también para diversidades. Es la primera política pública de apoyo a esta población también fuertemente vulnerada, invisibilizada en, en sus derechos. Our experience, our experience with Sugiro Mayango, uh, you, know, you know, the first step, step is having evidence of impact. And, and for us, those, those were the two cluster randomized, randomized trials, which involved over a thousand families and showed not only did we reduce intimate partner violence and harsh punishment of children, as well as promote child development, but those effects were sustained one year later. But, but then you can't stop at the uh, effectiveness study. Uh, that's, that's why our team, team has really shifted towards in the play collaborative strategy that Grace discussed. Uh, a strategy for scaling out and sustaining quality in the practice and demonstrating that we can still get these benefits at greater scale. And another feature of the play collaborative implementation science uh, that was described is enhancing local government buy-in. And so, as you saw in Grace's description, we're working with actors from the national level to the district, to the sector, to the cell, to the village level. Um, to, to enhance, enhance stakeholder engagement so people understand, understand what the program is, is are a part of problem solving. Sorry, Teresa, sorry to interrupt, but we're getting quite a lot of echoing. Um, have you got two devices on or? 
No, no sorry, sorry, I don't, don't but, but that's, that's okay. okay. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's probably, probably just, just the home life. life. It's just technology. I'm sincere apologies to um, our interpreters, our sign interpreters. I know that that was really challenging to, to be able to um, translate. Um, but I think we got the gist of what you were saying about the scalability, um, Teresa. I'm really sorry that the technology failed us a little bit. Um, look, I think we've come to uh, the end of our time, unfortunately. It feels like we could talk about this a lot more um, and for much longer. Um, but thank you all for engaging in this really interesting topic. And especially our panelists for providing so generously um, of your, in, your experience and, and the research. Um, discussions on how we can use social protection programs and policies can address, prevent and eliminate gender-based violence are I think essential to advancing gender equality and women's empowerment. I would now like to hand over to Calliope Minguru, um, Chief of the Ending Violence Against Women and Girls Team at UN Women to provide the concluding remarks and close today's event. Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Padma, and thank you uh, especially for your such a graceful moderation of that event. Thank you, DFED and Arrows for this really amazing event, and especially our experts for really providing these very good insights about how can we combine social protection mechanisms and policies in order to have an impact on addressing violence against women and girls in um, really attending this impact and not uh, having it happening accidentally. And uh, we heard a lot of information today and we really need the uh, now more than ever on how to have effective ways to address violence against women by using the broader social protection mechanism and women's economic empowerment uh, more broadly. And unfortunately, we have heard very clearly that so far the application of social protects, protection systems and mechanisms, it has been happening in a rather ad hoc a way and they are very underexplored on how they can have an impact on addressing violence against women and girls. And these two fields, they don't seem to be in conversation together. And I think that uh, it came uh, up really clearly in the discussion today. And uh, what we know mostly, it's around the, the cash transfers. And as we heard from our panelists, it's really unexplored the broader social protection ecosystem and the impact it can have on addressing, reducing violence against women and girls and the drivers that it really um, uh, provokes, uh, creates violence against uh, women and girls. And we uh, heard that uh, they can really address uh, social protection mechanisms, they can really address household financial stress, and they can also support uh, survivors in uh, the aftermath of violence in order to be able to uh, escape such uh, violence. And we also heard about uh, how especially marginalized groups of women uh, and girls, they are in need of having access to uh, social protection mechanisms. Usually they don't have access to uh, such mechanisms, especially because of the poverty exclusion uh, that they face in society more broadly. If I can leave you with some uh, reflections, what we heard very, very clearly, it's first of all that we really need to have a better systems linkage if, if we want to explore the, um, uh, the full potential of the social protection mechanism in order to address violence against women and girls. I think that was very clear. The second reflection that I would like to share with you on how we need to embed the social protection mechanism in the broader ecosystem of what's happening in addressing violence against women and girls more broadly at national level. We heard about social norms, the national context, that it really affects also the social protection mechanism 
And if we want to have some sustainability and long-term effectiveness, that needs this social protection design in order to have an impact on violence against women and girls needs to be embedded in the broader work that we do in this area at national uh, level. And also uh, we heard how important it is to have closer collaboration with service providers and especially women's rights organizations that they do the work on violence against women and girls. And uh, uh, Tara raised a very good point on how do we bring, bring in the same room, the social protection field and the GPV um, specialists in order to talk to each other and to have shared priorities around what needs to be done. As you and women, together with our partners, we really envision through the action coalitions and the multi-stakeholder platforms to bring these different fields together from the action coalition on GBV and the action coalition, especially on economic justice and rights to talk to each other and to have some shared priorities and understanding of what needs to be done in order to have a real impact of social protection mechanism on violence against uh, women and girls. And I think this approach, it will also contribute to the effectiveness of these interlinkages between the two fields and the sustainable result in uh, longer term. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to continuing this partnership and collaboration in the future as well.